everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so my name is my name is Henry Picavet. I'm the editorial director of TechCrunch, which I'm sure all of you read it every day, um, every story. Um, but joining me today are Dan Runcie of Trapital, Ikram Mansouri of Cura. Is that you say? Cura. Cura. And Brian Dixon of Kapoor Center in uh, Kapoor Capital in right. Oakland. Go Oakland. So I'm just going to kick it off and just get right into it and ask uh, our two founders up here what their founding stories are. Just you know, give me a little bit of a background and how you got into it and, and when you made the transition. Mm -hmm. We'll get you in there. Yeah, Thank sure. You. So Trapital is a media company that focuses on hip hop business and strategy. I started the company last year, but it's to give you the quick synopsis on the vision. I started freelance writing uh, in 2014. It purely started as a hobby. I was doing it myself, and it was something that I always wanted to do. I'd recently started a full-time job, fresh out of graduate school, and I wanted to have a creative outlet to really hone my craft and have something that I did outside of work. Started to do that more and more. Started to get picked up by a few more um, outside publications that wanted me to do freelance writing for them. So I was like, okay, cool, let me do more of this. And a lot of the writing I was doing at the time was focused on hip hop and business and the various intersections it had. But the more and more that I wrote those stories, I felt like each of those stories was interesting, but they didn't necessarily fit within the home of the publications. And that stayed true the more and more reputable places I started to write. And when I started to realize that disconnect, I thought a lot about how easy or how difficult it could be for me to start a publication that owned that voice and owned that focus because not only would it give me an outlet to write but I do believe that telling hip-hop business stories does help give awareness to the power that a lot of hip-hop entrepreneurs have been able to accomplish in the country. They are some of the most um, successful founders and some of the most successful business people we have but the stories often skim the surface. And I wanted Chapital to help solve that and address that. And I've been doing that for a year now, and I'm excited to continue seeing that vision move forward. How, um, really quickly, how do you, when you decide to make the leap from freelance to doing your own um, thing, what were you thinking about making money? Mm. Did that scare you? Right. Or it did, it did, because at the time when I was freelancing, I still had a full-time job. Okay. So. The work that I was doing for different publications, I'd written stuff for Complex and Wired in the past, it was all additional money that I had. So I needed to get to the point where I could say, me starting Trapital and doing this full time, not only does this, sub, not only does this cover the additional money I had as a freelance writer, but it also needs to eventually cover the income that I had with a full time job that I initially moved out to the Bay Area for. And that was a pretty tough decision to make, but I think for me, it was a matter of feeling like I was financially secure at the time. Luckily, was able to save up some money from the job that I had, but also believing in the business model and the opportunity. I knew that to support the work I wanted to do at Trapital, I knew that there was a base of people that both A, work in the music industry or work in business and want to better understand hip hop's impact in society and that those people would be willing to pay for that information and content in the future. And that's what's giving me the um, confidence to push this vision forward. So um, still in the works, you know, we'll see whether or not it ends up working, but I definitely feel pretty confident in its potential. So yeah, I ended up making the leap to work on Trapital full time three months ago and um, been doing that ever since. Okay. Ikram, how about you? Um, when did you decide to start Kura? I was actually still in uh, the government. So I have a background in counterterrorism uh, and signal intelligence and I've done that for nearly 10 years. So between army and government agency. Um, I'm originally from San Francisco. By originally, I mean I immigrated to San Francisco when I was 16. Um, I'm originally from Morocco. Um, and so San Francisco is my home. So growing up here and also having almost all the women in my family, like in the beauty industry or the, the uh, service, like provider type of care industry. Uh, and also I attended beauty school when I was in Morocco as a teenager. So coming back from the government to San Francisco, making small transitions to pursue Kura, I initially worked in tech at Twitter and with the Tech Coalition. 
in signal intelligence combating children's sexual exploitation and terrorism. Um, and then, actually, I'm a USF uh, grad. I went to, um, uh, I, I, <laughs> woohoo! Yes, go Dons! <laughs> uh, I got my Master's of Science in Entrepreneurship and Innovation, my beautiful co founder here. Uh, that's where I found her. <laughs> and uh, thank you. <laughs> and so, uh, Cura is a, the first, the true first consumer to consumer marketplace for on-demand self-care services. So just to give you some context into the numbers of this industry, um, we're gonna focus just on beauty because that's where we're launching our MVP, Minimal Viable Product. Um, so again, beauty industry is projected to be at a trillion dollars in 2025. Currently is over $500 billion. Um, yet the average American beautician makes less than 36,000 a year. Like, that's just mind-boggling. Um, you look deeper into the numbers, over 92% of the service providers in the industry are women. And so we decided to do something about it. Uh, we put all these brains of Masters of Science and Entrepreneurship and Innovation together, uh, figured out a solution, which is a marketplace. So providing a free platform for service providers to, to help them succeed, like, from end to end booking, you name it, uh, payments, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a million other ways we can make our money. Um, so that's what we did. Um, and we just launched our beta. Uh, if you want to check us out, go to Cura, C-U-R-A-H dot co, and join the revolution. And so, again, um, we are in the business of self-care. So once we launch our, uh, once we complete our beauty uh, product and we go into other segments. Uh, any other questions? I'm, I'm like all over questions. the place. No, you're fine. <laughs> what, um, what other segments are you thinking of? Is that so, so defining self-care. So <coughs> millennials, the, 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 the millennials have the buying power of $1.4 trillion. That's a lot of money. And millennials care, like literally, we care about self-care twice as much as any generation. So uh, self-care, like the way we define it, is anything we do um, to make us look good or feel good. And so self-care, th there's a number of things. Um, it could be Reiki, it could be uh, massages, it could be anything. So again, with that industry, everything that exists currently is a B2C model uh, because that's how people make most their percentages. Uh, what we're trying to provide is a marketplace for these service providers to excel as their own entrepreneurs. And by that, making it uh, a solution that is globally scalable. What was your funding process like? We are currently funding. <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, so we bootstrapped all the way. Okay. Um, and anybody, everyone knows bootstrapping? No, see, there's a no in the room. So bootstrapping is literally like when you have boots and you try to like lift yourself up, you're like, you know, kind of lift. Your, so that's what you do with, when you fund your own company. Um, you're bootstrapping it. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so with that said, uh, again, we have like an amazing team. Like our team like literally grew overnight. Um, and I call them the Kura Believers. <laughs> and so, and they're like uh, from all sorts of industries. Um, uh, w again, today's product, uh, when it comes to tech, again, like I might be in beauty, but I am in tech. Like we were the first company to do a consumer pitch in virtual reality. So we had th this uh, virtual reality pitch where we <laughs> embodied these little like balls and stuff like that and like got to impersonate literally our personas and show all these audiences from around the world, whether they were VCs, but it was more so to showcase the future of pitching. Um, so we're pretty, we're heavily involved in tech um, and we're really trying to address a huge issue um, in an underserved community um, that is more so like a global um, issue for us. Yes, yeah. self-care. Making it affordable, accessible, and convenient. Cool. Um, Brian, so we just talked about um, investing. What do you look for when you're looking for a company? 
to invest in? It's a big question, but. Yeah, so uh, just to give you some context of Caper Capital, yeah. we're a early stage venture fund. Um, we typically look for companies that are closing gaps of access or opportunity for low income communities or communities of color. Uh, and what that looks like is the first, let's call it million dollars going into a company we try to get involved in, or that first million to two million in a seed round. So kind of a, from 500K to a million, we consider pre-seed, um, and then from a million to two million, we consider seed. Um, so what we look for, it depends on if it's an early stage company in pre-seed or a later stage kind of seed company. I think the similarities between the two is, uh, one, it's, it's a team. Um, so we're looking for a team that has hopefully a CEO, just because it's mandatory, somebody with the vision to, to not only fundraise but to recruit. Um, we're looking, most of our products that we invest in are tech, um, so we want to see a CTO, chief technical officer on the team. Um, and then we we'll want somebody who might be in charge of operations or biz dev, um, depending on if it's a consumer or an enterprise kind of product. So team is, I would say, is, is most important. If you're building a company, a lot of times folks will put, hey, I want to raise a million dollars. And it's like, well, let's take a step back and think about, do you have the team in place to go out and to do that? Um, the next is, you mentioned minimum viable product, or MVP, of what have you built so far? Um, it's now cheaper uh, to build software, assuming that you have the, the right team in place. Um, so we want to see some product that we can potentially use, more importantly, see some users who are experiencing the product and finding value from that product. Um, and then I would say the last is, well, what market are you in? Um, is this a growing market? Do the trends support what you're doing? Are they going to 2x, 3x, hopefully 10x in the next kind of five years? Or what's that trend look like? Um, and for us, which is not every venture firm, is impact. Um, how does this actually help the communities that you want to serve? Um, so those are the yeah, big four. Those are big. Yeah. <laughs> um, what? What? Um, okay. How would you? How would you say you go about finding a team? What if you're just one person, <clears throat> and you really have a good idea, and you're saying you need to have a team? Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. I, well, if you're if you're starting a company, that's the first job, right? Mm -hmm. Like as a CEO, your first job is to go recruit a team. Um, and that might be your classmate, that might be somebody that you meet at a meetup, uh, that might be a, an old friend, it might be even family. Um, it really doesn't matter kind of how you find them, but more importantly that you do find them. Um, it's a challenge though, right? Especially for the CTO role. That's the, the number one position that I think companies that we see just don't have yet or they're kind of looking for. Why is it difficult? I, I think there's a lack of um, technical talent that's especially here in the Bay Area, that the alternatives are, I can go work at a Google, Google Twitter, get all these perks. Yeah, get all the perks, um, versus work on the startup that I might get paid, I don't know, four X less than I would at Google. Or you can go to Mission Bit. Or go to Mission Learn Bit. Learn coding. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and so that brings up another question for all of you. What, <clears throat> what are the pathways into tech? Not everybody wants to learn how to code. Yeah, sure, you can go find somebody, but yeah. then you need the money to pay them. Um, that's where you, they go to you to hopefully get money. But I don't know, I mean, there, there, there does seem to be an, a pathway in without having to learn how to code, if you want to, right, in the tech. Right, definitely. So the job that I had full time when I had started Trapital, I was working for um, strategic partnerships and external relations for an ed tech company. And for me, that was my entry into the tech space. Like. Um, a lot of my peers at the time, I didn't have a coding background. I did you know, some SQL years ago, but that's nothing compared to R and Python and everything else that developers do you know, at the back of their hands now. But for me, I knew that that was a skill set, not only that I wanted to get better at, but I knew that there was a need for in a lot of tech companies, because if you think about it with your typical SaaS product, yes, like as Brian's saying, you need your engineers, you need your CTOs, and you need that core team. But as that team expands, like once you start to reach you know, further rounds of fundraising and you need to have an established company, you're gonna need people that can go out there to either A, sell the product to consumers or sell the product to other businesses or engage. So with the company that I was at, we worked closely with broadband and getting broadband in schools. So we met with 
government. We met with um, governor's offices across the country. We met with broadband service providers, your Comcasts, your AT&Ts, and other folks across the country. And for that, that was a way that I could get my foot into the door without needing to code. So as companies get larger, they tend to have a lot of the same roles that you would find at um, other organizations. Dan, speaking of size, what um, what is your plan in the next couple of months? You're alone. Right. Do you have a plan to add your team or? Right. So it's interesting because I think typically with you know most venture-backed companies, having a team in place is ultimately what you do need. I think for what I'm doing with Trapital, it's a bit more unique because right now it is a brand that is based on an individual, which is me, and having that voice. And for solo solo writers and solo publishers, there actually is more of a recent wave where people have been able to do more of that. Because if you look at it with the future of Trapital, I would be writing additional content during the week and would be launching a podcast in the future. So some of those things may involve bringing on people to help, whether it's for interviews that may come through or some administrative tasks to help with particular things. But creating that content would continue to be a solo role that I would fill myself. So considering that with that and that the business model of Trapital will be paid subscriptions, so that is people then um, subscribing to the newsletter, it is a manageable job for one person. With that said, it's a lot of work for that person to do, which is me, but I do think that that is a path that we've seen successful with newsletters and in other industries, and if you, kind of, we don't have to name them here. If anyone has questions, we can talk about it later, but there's been a number of successful routes there, but I do think that, at least with the way Trapital stands today, it will be a solo project that I will be able to either contract or reach out to other folks as needed. There could be a future where there are other um, opportunities and that's something I'm definitely keeping in mind as as I grow but I do think that with the way the um, newsletter the media company is today it can stand as a, um, a successful solo operation. Cool. Ikram, how big is your team? We are right now at 21. So and, and the beauty of that so initially how I got Barbara to join the team it was this like last BAM, like you're in our last semester, I just pitched CUDA. I had worked with a number of geniuses. And again, like talking about team, the team always beats the lone genius. And so, and I, I had in mind who I would want on my team. And so when I pitched, I was like, you know, if you're interested, WhatsApp me. Cause it was like, it was like a lot of foreigners, you know what I mean? So like not everybody could text me, so WhatsApp me. Um, and. Uh, Barbara immediately uh, hit me up, there were a couple others, and so like we started out that way. And then again, um, it's a relationship that, like, you ha it's, a, it's a marriage relationship between uh, founders and co-founders. And we have a deep understanding of like really just putting it all on the table because we can easily mis miscommunicate or like feel a, a certain way. And we don't have the bandwidth to really have those misunderstandings. Um, and. I really just pitch my heart out. Um, I go out to the community because a marketplace is a community-based solution. If I don't have the people who I'm serving like on board with me, I'm not going anywhere. And so, you know, we're pitching to clients, we're pitching to, and again, I get my hair done all the time, I get my nails done all the time. So I just talk to them, you know, like, and I ask the same questions, the pain points, the way I did my market research, all of that. And uh, you know, I hit him with join the revolution. You know, give me your email, we'll follow up. Um, and we implemented small things here and there, and it, the magic happened. Like people started approaching me, hey, like really love the product, what can I do for you? Like, and this is like on volunteer basis, free, uh, and then like with that, like you get to see who's going the extra mile. We also had interns from UC Berkeley um, and so like we are just, you know, like going about it in any way we can. And um, again, like it's easy to, free, uh, to find freelancers, it's easy to outsource uh, s certain things. And uh, we're definitely <coughs> tools users. So um, tools make life so much easier. You know, like you might need to do a, a little bit of research to figure out, but if you come across a an issue during your startup, there's definitely, most likely there's something already that exists. 
that you can at least get it for free for a month or so <laughs> and like put it to use <laughs> um, and like try out different platforms, etc. So that would be yeah. my spiel on Teams. Staying with Teams, um, Brian, you, what when you when you all at Capo are looking for teams to to invest in, you focus on social impact. Mm -hmm. What what are your th I want to hear your thoughts on diversity and, and, and funding diverse teams and how you know we hear um, all over Silicon Valley and everywhere there's not enough diversity there's not enough diversity um, <clears throat> but I don't think people really understand why having a diverse team is important to success. Yeah, well, I mean, I agree. There's there's not enough diversity uh, in Silicon Valley. If you look at who gets venture capital funding, um, you know, it's under two percent are Black and Latinx. Um, which, you know, it's a question of, well, where's the other 98% going? Um, and then for women, it's about 10%. Um, so there's a huge funding gap of if you do decide to build a venture, a VC backable company, a part of that requires venture capital. And if the VCs, which we're a part of, aren't funding companies at the same scale that they are um, for other, or other founders, I think it's just a, a huge problem. Um, our numbers are in the same kind of fashion, you know, 60% of our most recent portfolio has either a, a woman, a woman of color or a person of color on the founding team. Um, and we measure it. I, I think that's the first thing is that, you know, you measure what's important. Um, but if you look at VC's websites, traditionally, they, they kind of, they say, I fund the best ideas or, you know, I don't see color or things of that nature. We see color, and we're, we're looking for it, and we're measuring it. Um, and every twice a year, we have a retreat, and we look at the numbers and say, who did we fund over the last six months? Um, are, we over, are we overfunding, for instance, all white male teams than uh, teams of color? Um, so not only looking, hey, we did a great job of funding, but actually following the check size along with that. And I think that it's just a healthy practice to see are you funding equally across the board, or is there some bias maybe in the selection process? Um, and, and to be honest, being on the other side of the table as a founder, there definitely is. I mean, think about f pitching a VC firm. Uh, you've got to, most times, you've got to know somebody at the firm, or you've got to know a founder that they've backed. So if you didn't go to that school, and you don't have that relationship, well, how are you supposed to have the same shot as somebody who was in the same dorm with, with uh, uh, associate at the firm. Um, so we have an open door policy. You can pitch us on the website and you'll get a response from a human being uh, every, it takes about five days. But we look at every single pitch and what happens is we end up seeing companies that we wouldn't normally have seen just because those folks aren't in our network. Um, and then we do the same thing from the hiring side of, you know, it's really easy to hire folks that you know, um, folks that maybe you've worked at, a, at another job um, instead, we have kind of, we don't do um, coffee meetings. Um, we, don't do, we don't do anything to give a, a, anybody an unfair advantage. Yeah. Um, so if, if we did a panel together and you're like, hey, let's grab a drink. Let's mm -hmm. talk about this role. I'm like, well, that will give you an unfair advantage. Right. You know more about the role, more about the examples, et cetera. Um, I think it, it's more work, and that's why sometimes people don't do it. Um, but for us, we think it's, it's worth the extra effort um, to keep a, a, a level playing field for all candidates and more importantly for all startups. You were saying earlier before we came up here that you aren't traveling as much because you're getting a lot more yeah. action at k yeah. What What's going on? Yeah, so, uh, well, I think, we s just to give you some context, we saw 3,000 deals last year and we invested in 14. Um, so so we, we see a lot of deals. Um, and the good news is that we're seeing a lot of deals that are not on, not on the coast. Um, so they're not in New York, Boston, they're not in the Bay Area, they kind of live in the middle of America. Uh, and that's for us is a good place to be. Um, I think it's one, I don't have to travel as much because we have a larger team, so we talk about team, um, which helps. Um, two, I think we have clear focus areas. Um, so we try to go to areas such as Atlanta, right? Where it's like, if we're looking for founders of color, we might want to go to the places where founders of color live, right? It's just simple, but a lot of firms don't do it. Um, so we try to build those things in. Um, and then we also, like I said, we have this open kind of door so anybody can apply on the website. And we've been taking a harder look at, at those companies because we think that there's some gems in there.
See, did you say in the last year, 3,000? You got 3,000 pitches? 3,000 pitches. And, and that might be through the website or email, but. Invested in 14. Invested in 14. I'm just going to ask why, why the disparity in the numbers? Is this not enough good ideas or not enough money or the 14 were amazing ideas? Yeah, I mean, it, it's capital. Um, yeah. So we're a $60 million or two funds, $60 million. Um, if you think about each company, let's say you put in a quarter million dollars to 500K, I mean, you can do the math. You have a, a limited amount of companies that you're able to select from. Um, so that's one. And I think the second is the bar for who ends up in that 14 continues to, to, to raise as time goes on. Um, it's, it's cheaper and quote unquote easier to start a startup. It's still as hard to be successful, right? Like that hasn't, hasn't changed. Um, but I think there are more people who are starting companies, so therefore you just see more companies pitching for venture capital money. Yeah. Um, do you have a, do you have <laughs> that a, 14 uh, got you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you have a, um, well, yeah, and I respect everybody who's trying to get money for their startup. Um, so when you, when you, yeah. <laughs> so, you can, so when you hear, when you hear those kinds of numbers, how does that make you feel? Uh, I was, did I mention I was a paratrooper, U.S. Army? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you left that out, I'm a actually. combat veteran. Um, and again, so back to how CUDA started, um, and, and working in such dark spaces and being deployed all the time, and like I had to really get comfortable in finding my resiliency. What does that look like? And most of the time, resiliency and self-care go hand in hand. And self-care for me was beauty. You know, it's like, go spend $200 at Sephora and like, you know, <laughs> take my money. <laughs> and so, and also like just talking to uh, the service providers who happen to be, uh, uh, most of them, the majority are women uh, and, and the constant struggle of just money, 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 right? Um, it's really, I, I have high resiliency, um, you know, like I'm able to take rejection just fine. Um, you know, like if you're not a, a, a Kuda um, believer, if, you know, it's okay, you could step away uh, ne next, right? Um, and also, like a lot of people say it's a numbers game, like just go knocking on, um, on doors and like, uh, but w we don't necessarily believe in that. Um, you touched on diversity and inclusion. Uh, we are super conscious about that. Our team is super diverse. Actually, Barbara is the minority in our team. <laughs> Um, and, and it's uh, it's not just color when it comes to diversity yeah. and inclusion. Um, we try to uh, uh, give opportunity even to uh, these service providers as freelancers. Um, we found some amazing ones with like really like w in the military you promote based on potential. They have really high potential like and, and they're willing to run with things and, and get it done. And so we have that safe space where we get together. And I'm like, look, I need this, I need this, and I need this from you. Figure it out, you know? And slowly people just joined us, et cetera. Uh, with that said, uh, we have advisors. Uh, we have people who believe in us. It, it's extremely hard because like, at first we're like, okay, we, we just need this much money. Um, but then along with everything that's happening with fundraising, you're also building a product. And you're also running a team. And so what comes first? You know, all of it comes first. You know, you're also gotta keep your customers uh, engaged, keep up with your social media, et cetera. And so it's really a strategic game. Um, and so actually this month, we're cranking up on uh, fundraising and we're just, you know, we're gonna go out there and get our money one way or another. Good. All right, good. Uh, Dan, when you, when you talk about um, how you're doing the, the capital alone in, in a couple of months you're did you, you guys suggest something to say about what's, with your future you're kind of like very near future you want to mm -hmm. say that now or yeah yeah so um later in may well i guess tomorrow's may so in <laughs> may <laughs> it's fun like i was just saying the months are like creeping up sooner rather than later so may um i'm going to launch the premium version of capital so trapital Trapital will be a freemium newsletter. So right now I write one article a week that is available to everyone. And these are deep dives where I go in and I talk specifically about one particular topic, whether it's an artist and uh, 
deal or a business decision that they've made and I'm going in and doing deep dives the same way that you know the Wall Street Journal or others would do deep dives on what Disney is doing with Disney Plus or what Elon Musk is doing with Tesla and going in and then ultimately having you know my take on what I think will happen in the future but then I'll have additional content during the week that are that is more focused on the timely things that are happening within hip hop business. So that'll be my opportunity to talk about um, Jay Z and the concert that he had last weekend in New York, or Childish Gambino and him headlining Coachella, and what I think that means for the rest of his year, and and and, and things like that. And for me, this is ultimately the, the model that I've chosen for Travel to run as a business. But I do think that one of the things that's most valuable with being able to write about this topic and write about it in depth is that it forces me to like build skills in a number of ways. Because not only do I have to look rigorously at what these artists are doing, I also need to have like a macro view about how I'm managing my own business, how I'm managing my own company. But in some ways, it often helps reinforce things because even though Trapital is not a management or I am not an artist trying to put out music, a lot of those same lessons that you're forcing yourself to learn about what Jay-Z or what Beyonce is doing can be applicable to what I'm doing as well. So it helps to provide like an additional opportunity each week to do that. So that's been something that I've been you know, fortunate and happy about. But I am with that excited because I think one of the questions you're asking, like how do you know the moment that it's time to take the next step? I realized that one, there were a lot of people that had reached out and wanted more content to come during the week. So that's always a good reminder. If people want more content, that's good. But then secondly, um, I was starting to get notice from like the right people. So as I mentioned before, the people that work in the industry, the people that you know work for streaming companies, the more and more of a uh, response I was getting from those folks made me feel more confident that this is important because this is lacking and it's lacking because people want this. So when you feel like you have something that has a fit in the marketplace, it does make sense to push it forward and see, see where it can go. How far out have both of you planned your, your companies? So in a year, are you gonna have a team of three and in a year, are you gonna have, where are you, where are you in a year? Yeah, we, we have a, our five-year projection, like in financial and in everything else. So with CUDA, in conducting our uh, market research and product market fit, uh, so we at this point, we already have traction. It's a matter of really getting the money so we can push out a better product um, to retain that traction and really explode. Um, and so we are in our market research product market fit. We did it in different countries, um, in Africa, um, uh, in Morocco, Algeria, South Africa. We did it in the GCC, the Gulf region. We also did it in uh, Latin America. And currently we have wait lists of beauty service providers waiting to use the platform in those regions. So pretty excited. We just need to get on it. And we plan to expand. One of the biggest failures of the tech giants have been localization and expansion into other regions. So we're planning to be very you know, sensitive to that and, you know, Well, in a strategic. way, you have, to be, you have to be nimble, too, exactly. to be able to do that. Yeah, right. so like, w yes. And, and we've, we have our, our strategy to go into that and also, like, having local teams uh, that know, not only know the culture, um, but know, like, how things operate and giving the customers out there, like, what they really need. Because we just try to, we tend to just push the American way on everybody. It doesn't necessarily uh, work to our advantage. Um, and like we can learn that from Uber or many other, to, to even Airbnb, all these marketplaces. So, so yeah. Yeah, for me, I have, I guess I both have the macro and the micro view of what's planned out. So from a macro perspective, I do have the rest of 2019 and then some planned out in terms of the main goals that I do want to, do want to hit this year. Because for me, so I started working on this full time beginning of February and my goal, as I said, within the next four to six months, I wanted to be able to launch the premium version of Trapital, I want to be able to launch a podcast and I want to be able to take those and see where they go, knowing that I'll need to iterate as they go and be flexible. But those were the main two goals that I had for the first six months of the year. And the timeline has actually moved up a little bit because we're still 
not yet. I haven't hit yet hit that four month part, and I'm already you know launching uh, one of those things. So I'm happy. So I'm happy about that. And then from a micro perspective, though, as someone that's not just running a business, but also the same person creating the content, I need to be able to have a calendar of the things that I want to be able to hit and how I'm managing my schedule. So I do tend to keep that fairly tight, but I also want to add flexibility because anytime, and I'm sure you could probably relate to this as well, anytime you're covering media, you want to be able to be flexible because you never know what could happen. And if something major happens, you want to be able to move things around. So between now and June, I do have my content calendar set, especially for those deep dive pieces, because I view those more as timely pieces of content, right? So even though I'm talking, uh, even though I wrote a recent piece about Beyonce and how her decision to take, you know, lemonade off of title and what I think that means, even though that's an immediate thing that happened a week and a half ago, it still carries lessons with, have, with everything that she's done over the past five years and how I think she'll continue to carry her business moving forward. If I'm right, then I can continue to reference that in pieces. But if I'm wrong, then it also gives me an opportunity to say, hey, like this is a learning process. This is where I thought I was incorrect in moving that forward. But it helps keep a bit of that. Um, it helps the shelf life of those pieces last. And that ultimately helps the reach of each of those pieces. Because in many ways, that's my form of marketing, right? People find out about travel because they read one of these in-depth pieces. Oh, wow, this sounds interesting. Let me sign up for this guy's newsletter. I then get it in my inbox on a regular basis. And then further on, you would then see the topics that I've written about on a daily basis. And it's like, oh, this is interesting. I've become a bit more familiar with this person's voice. I kind of like what he has to say. I may not agree with all his takes, but you know, some of them are interesting. And then that's ideally how the funnel would work. And knowing that every person and falls somewhere on that funnel. Like some people are gonna be good with the weekly piece they get, but some people are gonna want more trapital. And kind of to reinforce what I said earlier with how writing about the artist helps reinforce things, some people are gonna be fine getting lemonade two year, three years later once it ends up on Spotify, but some people wanna pay title $10 a month or however much it is to get it the minute it comes out. And like those are the type of things that I mention when I say that writing these pieces also can help you, you know, reference for me as I'm thinking about how to structure my business. We've got a few minutes left. I wanna, um, we're at a university and uh, we hear uh, we, that student debt is, is astronomical, seemingly insurmountable for some. Um, and you have big tech companies hiring people who don't have college degrees. So what are your, your th the three of you, what are your thoughts on staying in school, leaving school early if you have a fabulous idea, school overrated, how many of you love school here? Give <laughs> hands. <laughs> you look very confused. Um, for me, I would say, it, like, you pave your own path. Um, school isn't necessarily for everyone. I personally just took lots and lots of classes. If you look at my LinkedIn, I've been to like 10 universities. Um, with like almost no degree for the longest, uh, but also I was a subject matter expert in my field. Um, and so like you necessarily don't need to be in school to be really good at something and be valued. Um, what's important is school is almost a way to find what you want to do. It's almost a safe zone. It's like, okay, yes, I'm going to do four years of college and life will be, is going to be great after. And um, if you go that path, like enjoy it to your fullest, and like you know, like you can do mission bit coding. Um, you know, if coding is a thing for you, then you go that path and be like, maybe I'll drop out and be the next Zuckerberg. You know what I mean? So, that's my two cents for you. Sure, uh, I'll jump in. <laughs> uh, I mean, we're at a university, and I have two two degrees, so I, I would say uh, obviously. Just to mention, I am a PhD student yeah. in strategic intelligence. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I would say stay in school, uh, but leverage school. Um, so you know, I'm Jamaican, all right, and which means that like at any given point, I've got at least one job, maybe like three. Yes. Um, and it's the same thing with school, right? Like using school to get internships or to open doors. Um, one of the things that I found, especially, I didn't find this in undergrads, so I'm telling to you all now, uh, but I did find during my MBA is to utilize the alumni network. Um, yes. And like before, once I got an email for my MBA, I just went in and like 
email of like any alumni that was in venture capital. And that was super helpful because they took meetings with me when other people might not have taken meetings with me. Um, so I would say to utilize your, all the resources here on campus um, and to utilize it to get an internship or a job. Um, I ended up getting this job that I'm in eight years ago through a summer internship. Um, and it, you know, it was my first year of school, I, I got an internship. They said, come on back. I came on back for the second summer. I did another internship, so two internships. And then they said, were, were they hiring. paid? They were paid. Okay. Um, <laughs> get a paid internship too. Like people are not paying for internships. I have a huge problem with that. But they were paid internships and they said, we're hiring for this role full time. And, and I just, I was not, I didn't graduate yet. I had a, another year of school to do during my MBA. And I said, I would love to apply. I applied, I got the job, and I still have to go to school full time. So I was working full time and like flying to Boston like on the weekends to take classes. And it was painful and it was terrible, but I'll tell you this, it was worth it. And like looking back, it's like, it's one year of your whole life. Um, you can make it through, make it through that. So that's my, my take. Yeah. For me, I also have two degrees and still have student loans to pay back for what I'm doing. And of course that was also a big factor with me going full time. I needed to make sure that I was in a good financial place to pay that. But I do know that there's like a big debate going on in general, kind of like to what um, you know we're saying, like college is very expensive. But I do think for me, it, it still did give invaluable things, not just college, but me going to business school as well. And I think that there was a mentality shift where the jobs that I got after business school, there was still a little bit of like, okay, I feel lucky to have this job and this is what I'm on the path to do and this is the job I have and you see what's happening in Silicon Valley or you see people building companies that still feels a little bit far removed but then you know going to business school and then being able to take advantage of the opportunities I had the biggest um, benefit not only was the alumni network which was great I didn't have that strong of a network before but it was also the mentality shift there's also this belief that, okay, no, I can do a lot of those things that you hear about other people doing. I believe in myself to be able to you know, launch a company and start things and really see the visions that come, come you know, to fruition. And when you think about what it means to like have that type of mentality and then the opportunities it brings, assuming that things work out, it's hard to put a price tag on that. And I think that's on a case-by-case -case basis. I think especially as a minority, it helped give me an additional boost of confidence from that perspective, and I think that's, you know, that's carried through. So I do think that it still makes a difference, so I'm sure that some of you may feel you know, a bit frustrated being in school and you're hearing all these people that drop out or just do dev boot camps or what it is. Like, no, I think you're here, you're here for a reason, and I think that any educational journey has its peaks and has its moments of frustration, but you all came here for a reason, so you know, I definitely have confidence in that, and I can speak from my own experience that it definitely helped me. Can I add something? As a USF grad of <laughs> Masters of Science in Entrepreneurship and Innovation, I truly went into this program with a purpose, a purpose of pursuing CUDA um, and hopefully finding a co-founder out of CUDA, which I did, um, uh, out of USF. And we also were, Barbara and I were part of the entrepreneurship club at USF and through that we managed to go to 500 Startup and like Y Combinator and met a lot of VCs and you know, like a lot of entrepreneurs and asked questions and questions and coming to the business model where we're at right now and having multiple streams of revenue and how we're going to deploy them, like we're going to do this first and then implement this, that didn't come overnight and it come with the help of, and the support of like the School of Management at the University of San Francisco and along with many, many other people. So I do agree with if you're already in school, might as well use it to your advantage. Is there one type of entrepreneur is that a trick question? <laughs> nah, just, just popped in my head. <laughs> what would you say? Yeah. It's like mental extrovert. Right. Um, but, yeah. but, but is that the only type? Mm -hmm. Yep. My, I, think, I think there's multiple types. Um, I, I think in general there are some skills that like, kind of transcend, like you need to be comfortable with taking risk, you need to be comfortable with um, you know, putting your ideas out there and seeing what can happen. But to be honest, I know a lot of entrepreneurs that are very risk averse. And 
it, it in many ways it speaks to the definition of entrepreneurship, right? Like not every entrepreneur is trying to start the next unicorn. Some people are more content building, you know, companies that they believe are modestly scalable. I think it takes, you know, two different mentalities and two different perceptions to be in those different camps. But even within that perspective, like in entre even within, you know, a venture backed um, startup, you know, an entrepreneur that's pursuing something that is purely a, a SaaS product is different than someone that's trying to do a hardware product like I think like the how you're wired and how you're thinking about the challenges are different and I think yeah in general it requires some tenacity but from the people I met I met all sorts of people so I do think that there's a number of different varieties yeah I, I think a, a skill that's important is the ability to recruit recruit the missing pieces right so if you're doing kind of that hardware play um, but you are not an electrical engineer, you're not an engineer. Well, if you can find somebody who can build, and maybe they're an engineer, maybe they're not, but they can get ship that product, I think that's important. Um, some people are r really reserved. I mean, we've got 130 companies in the portfolio. Um, some people can sell anything. Other people are like, nope, don't want to talk to anybody. Um, but they have a great head of sales who loves to talk. Uh, and they're just not going to be that social butterfly, kind of warming people up, selling them whatever they need to sell. They don't have to um, because they were able to recruit that, that missing piece. Yeah. I, I would totally agree. Like, we're all, like, as human beings, we're all, we're, we're all wired differently. We all process and project things differently. Um, and so when hearing you and you talk, like, my mind went to the Fry Festival. That entrepreneur like was so good like at like just talking the talk and almost you know walking the walk. He was probably like hopping around or whatever, but <laughs> <laughs> but but like that's like he is an entrepreneur and he has done businesses before. Uh, does that mean like he's a good entrepreneur? You know, and and another part that we don't get to really talk about in entrepreneurship a whole lot is the ethics of it. Um, and that's like just as equally important goes along with the diversity and inclusion and all of that and so like and as an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley of a minority you come you come across those things like day in day out and like how do you deal with it like what's the appropriate way to deal with it what's not so appropriate do I just let it go like all these things you 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 face um, and it's a continuous like steep like trajectory of like learning so it's amazing like no day is the same yeah word, word. I think that's a good uh, <laughs> place to stop um it's uh do any of you have any questions time to open this the i can i will stop asking questions <laughs> you so my name Jared is Jared T. Ross. Ross my question uh specifically for Ikram and, and Dan is what kind of sacrifices did you find yourself making along the way as you're starting up and, and Brian you touched on the sacrifice so like going full time and going full time in school so feel free to add on to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah I'm, I'm in the middle of this right now. Um, it were, there, I, I, I made a plan for myself at the end of uh, 2018 because I knew what 2019 was going to look like and in many ways this is my bootstrapping period right now. I was fortunate, I was paid well at the, job, the last job I had, and there were a lot of things I didn't need to think twice about, which I feel like is a privilege living in the Bay Area. I now have to think about those things because even though I do have money saved up, the more disciplined I am with that money, the longer that I can you know, continue uh, pushing capital, you know, not relying on the business model of it making money itself. So I needed to make sacrifices in terms of uh, what did I do for social activities, how often I went out to eat, what I, you know, like, how, how, like where we bought food, like taking Ubers and Lyft places, all those types of things. And I don't think it's necessarily made my life more difficult, but it's definitely made me more conscious and then made me to have to say no to things that I normally would have said yes to. Um, it is also, but it's also for some discipline as well, because knowing the, the pressure that puts on it, I knew that I had to be more disciplined with my time if I'm going to make the most of the time frame that I have to make use of the money that I've, that I've saved up. So even times I've worked before, it was easy to, okay, no, I'm going to work a full day, but okay, if someone texts me, I can just pull out my phone, or if there's an email that comes through, maybe I can respond to it. But no, if you're going to put everything into this, then, you know, 
you're not going to look at your phone until later in the day or you're not going to go browse through Instagram or what have you. So those are some of the non-financial but time consuming things that I've had to do as well. And in some, some phases, you know, the time can be even more costly than the money. Um, sacrifices uh, really uh, depends on like what you value the most and what you consider you know to be sacrifices because my sacrifices might be different than yours you know um, so for me having gone to uh, <laughs> war zones um, and coming back I do value the little things I don't take many things for granted and so like if I feel like I want to splurge on my lunch, Barbara, I do it. <laughs> so Barbara, I get hungry all the time, I gotta eat, you know? Barbara's like, no, we can't afford this. And I'm like, Barbara, you don't get to talk to me like that. I'm gonna go get my salad. So, um, but in other uh, ways or means, like absolutely, you know, like, um, okay, like we're gonna do that, we're gonna use this tool, we're gonna piggyback off this. Uh, there, we also like run a nonprofit organization called Global Women Innovate, and in that organization, there are other uh, women of color, minorities, trying to run their own startup as well. Um, and actually, we started it at USF again. Go Dons! Mm -hmm. um, and the, the the whole point of it was like we had we had these. Uh, tools that were given to us and we just wanted to share it with underserved communities and since then we've launched coding initiatives in Morocco and um, workshops in entrepreneurship and innovation in Oakland and in San Francisco so we're just with very little we're going the you know the long road uh, but you do sacrifice a lot of a lot of your time I don't necessarily which is okay like you're 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 you know nurturing your baby um, if I have to work day and night, so be it. Um, and uh, f like what, what's important to me, for example, family, um, you know, close friends, maintaining those good relationship. As you all know it, you know, when, when um, Steve Jobs died, like he spoke heavily about relationships and how important they are. And to me, they are important, you know, c continuing this strong, um, you know, like community that, that, that supports you. and. To me, I, I can rely on my family. I can be like, yo, I'm so hungry. Who's cooking today? <laughs> I'm coming over, Moroccan food. Uh, or like, hey, like I, you know, I'm like running like tight, this, that. And like my mom sometimes was just, do you need money? Like, I'll go grocery shopping for you. I'm like, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there's like, and, and that's to, that to me means uh, the world, you know, but it does get to times where I have less time to spend with them and I feel like I'm neg neglecting them. But again, I'm like, you know, like I'm almost there, you know, like they're get, like they're seeing it, you know. So um, you just have to grind and um, know that it gets better. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think any of my stories can compare to entrepreneurs, right, who, who are doing kind of the real work. Uh, I think as a venture capitalist, you get an opportunity to work with a small or smaller portfolio. Um, I think it's a privilege to be able to support entrepreneurs. Um, I've been an entrepreneur myself. It's hard. Uh, I think that has taught me probably the most lessons being an investor, just to have empathy for the founder's journey. Um, because it's really easy at the end of the day of like, yeah, you, we work hard or we stay late at the office because it's a large portfolio. but you can't turn it off. Like as an entrepreneur, you can't turn it off, right? Like it is your business. If, if you're a solo founder like Dan and you decide for the weekend, I'm not gonna, or week, I'm not gonna work. Who else is working, right? Like literally nothing happens. In fact, probably negative things will happen with the business. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a privilege. I always tell folks of like my work in being able to support folks, not only with capital, but with time, um, is a privilege to call a job. Um, question specifically for Brian. So, um, looking from a student perspective, like breaking into VC, you mentioned that you started with the alumni network, right? Um, could you dig a little bit more into what kind of questions you were asking, what kind of things you were looking at, what kind of events you've been going to, and yeah, a little bit more for breaking into VC? Yeah. Um, so the question was, what what are some things uh, that you can do as a student when trying to tap into your alumni network um, to prepare for that? 
Um, so I'll, I'll be honest, in the start, I wasn't having really good, I guess, response rates. Um, and a part of it was because I was somewhat all over the place. And it took somebody to like, pull me aside and say, like, hey, I'm a Series D investor. <laughs> You're trying to be a seed investor, but you didn't know the difference. Um, and I'm like, that's a good point. Now I'm going to go look for, OK, what stage makes the most sense? Um, and it, it also is like, well, how likely does your background align with the roles that you might be looking for? Um, I think one that I've heard pretty often is just like, do your homework. Um, so there's a lot of free resources out there on, um, for instance, Venture Deals by Brad Felds is a great book and a great resource that pretty much outlines what it's like to be a seed stage investor and all the things from an entrepreneur side uh, that you should think about. But it also applies if you want to be a VC. Um, and it was, I think, those little nuggets, um, a lot of blogs, um, kind of getting free information. And then I think you'll start to see you start crafting different emails. Um, you make it more personal. So I think the mass email approach definitely doesn't work, even if you're reaching out to alumni. So I went to Babson, and you can't just say, hey, I'm a, going to Babson. I'm a first year. It's like, hey, I noticed that you worked at X, or I noticed that there's some interest that we might have together or I'm interested in. So making it more personal. Um, I think taking no. Uh, a lot of times, like, I offer to work for free, even though I really couldn't afford it. I was like, well, maybe if I get in the door, show some value, then if I got, if I got the job, if I work, show some value, that they'll start paying me. And like, I got to no, know, like, no, you can't work for free, and no, we don't want you to, to even come by and interview. And in my mind, I'm like, I don't want to work for free, but nobody's taking my call. And I think you just got to be, have thick skin, yeah. right? And when we say no as, as VCs all day long, but it's funny, like, when we're going out to, for a job or something, we get a no. It's like it's the biggest deal in the world, right? Like you got to be able to 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 take a no in stride, yeah. um, not get defensive about it, and, and really think about okay, what can I learn from this to take to the next opportunity? Oh, thank you. I just graduated from college. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'd love to know as I start my career, what guiding role models or values have helped um, create the decisions that you've made especially in the industries that are very unseen and underestimated in what you're in. So who were, who were role models that you had that led you to where you are right now in picking music, media, and beauty? Hmm. That's a good question. I think that um, for me, the, the role models I've had, many, especially with this, a lot of them have actually been like outside of the music space. Um, it's got to first just start from like a core perspective. I felt like I had good mentors, not just from jobs I've had, but like from other like networking opportunities. I mean, I started my career in an insurance company and a lot of those same people that I had as mentors still are able to help me today because even though I'm not still working in insurance and they're not either, they've taken risks throughout their um, careers and it's been able to be applicable to like what I'm doing as well. But I do feel like with each stage it's good to be able to like adjust and have some people that are, it's almost like, I'm sure you've all heard the term like who is your personal board of directors? Right? Like who are the people that are actually going to help serve you with what you're doing? I still have the people that have known me since you know I was 19 or 22 that can still provide me with that helpful advice. But then I also needed to shift because I needed to have people in this current phase that I am now that can guide me that have also started you know small media companies that started off solo and then seeing what that experience was like and being able to reach out to them like what Brian has said you know well-crafted email can sift through a lot of um, you know noise and get a good response and they'll be willing to talk to me give me advice okay what stage did you hire a personal assistant what did that person help you with um, and, and and those types of things so it's it's been about adjusting but I feel like me being proactive it's good to keep the people that know me but the people that can also help with the direct thing that I'm working on um, working on right now uh, what career career path are you going into oh thank you uh, I am uh, I'm president of the Entrepreneurs Club before this, so I'm a awesome. big, um, I, I'd love to go into tech. I, I'd love to get into product, maybe product analytics in terms of product management. Um, and then I've, um, I think, yeah, Bob's great, I read Three Kings. Mm, really good. Good book, yeah. And um, I've met, we've met Backstage Capital mm -hmm. that they were here 
at the time I started grad, so BC is really interesting. I don't know if I can be an entrepreneur, but um, I, I, you know, thank you for asking. Yeah, I don't know that. What's happening. No, no, I was just. Post grad, everybody, you don't know what happened. <laughs> Um, the reason I was asking just out of one out of curiosity and two like maybe like I can give you oh, more context something that you know that could be useful to you um, I offer you Barbara she's a product manager you should connect with her in a data company yes oh, <laughs> in a data um, well, we have met, I've met a lot of well. there you go yeah. yes <laughs> um, so um, as, as an entrepreneur, you do have to do product management and product development yourself. Um, with that said, I delegated that to Barbara uh, because again, the team beats the lone genius. Um, and so with mentorship advice, um, I feel like I have my own army um, and minions. So mm -hmm. army and minions being that, you know, like, um, like for example, when I was in, in a government position and the people that were advising me and mentoring me they were <clears throat> they were experts in the field in a specific field they're geniuses in that space uh, but i couldn't ask them about startup they couldn't give me you know like valid advice in that space and so as you like maneuver around and like y you figure out okay like i need to to do take this one step right now i need to have like my support ecosystem um, and then like this is the vision like you don't necessarily need to fit know exactly how you get in there um, but you work slowly with that you know initial support ecosystem and you get to meet this making connections asking more questions and you don't get what you don't ask for it really boils down to the basics of that um, and like more uh, often than not people are willing to to help and support Thank you. Yeah, of yeah. course yeah. I, I couldn't agree anymore I mean you just don't know where your career is gonna take you to yeah. right and, and I feel like that's been my career I mean to give you context my first job was stocking dog food at Petco Right, and like I had no clue what entrepreneurship was, had no clue what VCs were, and I was just trying to figure it out. And then I went to undergrad and figured out, hey, there's this thing called coding, and learned about coding. I wish I had an organization like Mission Bit to kind of put me on that path, <laughs> but I just didn't have it. Um, and you know, there's many jobs that I've held. Some worked out really well. Some haven't. There's just to be honest with you. And I think th those were the harder ones, where it's like, I'm trying my best. I'm just not really that great at SQL, right? And like, I'm just not, I'm still not. Um, but I think showing up and being open to different opportunities, you mentioned that you might wanna work at a startup or early stage company. If that's something that you choose, you're gonna meet really interesting people and you don't know where those people are gonna end up. Uh, and I felt like the same thing in, in VC. There are folks who I met when I was interning who became partners at firms or started their own firms. And you mentioned backstage. And I remember when Arlen was getting started, right? Like, in a million years, I would never have imagined where I'm at right now, but I think I was open to potential opportunities um, and just letting somewhat of like, you can want something and try to aim for those things, but also if there might be something over here that could get you there, you just don't see it yet. Um, so it's been a wacky career path um, and it's still not over, to be honest, um, but trying to keep my eyes and ears open, but also saying, am I happy? Am I learning? I think those things, as long as you're doing those things, it's a good thing. Thanks. Yeah. And don't be afraid to do an internship after graduating. Like, I entered a bunch, um, even when it was like, you have a degree already. I'm like, that's okay. I need the experience. Um, I'm willing to learn. Um, I'm willing to show up. Yeah. All those gone. Yeah, so I have a question of you guys touched about on student loans for a little bit. I'd like to know how that limited your creativity or business <laughs> possibilities, you know? Coming in with the real bottle. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, because, you know, it's a concern since you guys have just raised tuition. I'll start. Um, so uh, I went to Northeastern undergrad. Uh, I had a, a computer science degree. Uh, I had a business minor. And it was not an option to pursue entrepreneurship. Like, I had to get a job. It was, if I was going to do entrepreneurship, it was working and doing entrepreneurship on the nights and weekends um, just because the loans had to get paid, and I felt like my parents did a great job of, one, supporting me through school. I've got other siblings that are coming behind me. It's just not fair of like, I didn't feel it was fair for me to 
not take a well-paying job in supporting myself and then putting that burden on whether my family or my parents. For me, um, again, I went to UC Davis. I was a biology major. Um, and I initially, I, when I moved here at 16, I, <laughs> mom told me to get a job. And so I was going to high school and I played soccer and after soccer, all muddy, I would go to Rite Aid. I was a cashier yeah. at Rite Aid. Um, and then I went to UC Davis. I was like, yay, I'm gonna be a doctor. <laughs> And then, like, student loans hit me real hard, and I'm like, hmm. And so my second year, I joined the Army. I, I currently do not have any loans, um, and the, uh, part of the reason why I'm actually pursuing my Ph.D. as well is because it's paid for. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have any advice for you on student loans. Yeah, I've, I've definitely had my fair share of student loans um, <laughs> over, the, over the years. And... I think for me, I've, I've, to be honest, I've often went back and forth about the how to best manage the expense itself, because you hear so many people growing up that talk about you know your good debt, your bad debt, and how okay it's education, it's good debt, and that's good and all, but those interest rates are real, and you know you have to be able to do something about that. So. I, I became pretty proactive, I'd probably say about three years after I graduated high school, about trying to find the lowest interest rates because I got myself educated on how important of a factor that really was for me. I felt like I was a novice when it came to that stuff, so it was like, okay, 7%, 4%, that's just 3%, what difference does it make? And then you get older and you're like, no, it makes a huge difference. And I know it, it does get a little bit in the weeds of this conversation, but I'm telling that because it really did make a huge difference. Like. If I still had, you know, six or seven percent loans, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing with Trapital right now. I needed to be able to refinance, make it to be much more affordable so that I was actually paying off principal and I knew that there was a light at the end of the tunnel because that made taking the risk of going out and doing this that much more realistic. So, of course, you know, it gets a little bit, like I said, in the weeds with the numbers, but those few percentage points made the difference of us doing the math and running the numbers to see whether or not this was going to work for us and whether or not the risk was worth taking for me. I, I didn't want to talk about loans particularly initially, but I would like to comment to say that there is a government subsidy program, subsidized program that adjusts your loan to the amount of income you make. Mm -hmm. And just as you research refinancing, I suggest those of you who have student loans and are graduating uh, look into this government option of reducing um, your, your loan that's due each month. In fact, it gets reduced so that the government pays the interest. It's a widely, once you look into this avenue, you'll see that it's, it's, it's pretty well known, but mm -hmm. if you don't know where to begin, um, but it, it's through the education department. Right. So I just wanted to, I teach entrepreneurship, and I thought this is such a dream team panel. It appears that there's some diversity here, but what really resonates among you is you're all seeking meaningful work. And that's the, what we in business really want our students to do, is to seek meaningful work. If, I, if we ask our business students, what are you here for? And they tell us to make a lot of money, we kind of cringe because <laughs> we know that person is probably going to have some real struggles with their the, at some point in their journey. So I, I think that uh, this, the search for meaningful work based on what you're really interested in will serve you well because even though when you start out you're not making top dollar, you're fulfilling a, a dream. You're, you're on the road and uh, you're learning and it's, it's very exciting to, to meet you all. Tech crunch, venture capitalist, beauty, and and media, it's very interesting. I have so many questions for you, but I'll, I'll save that to maybe a one-on-one. -on -one. But uh, thank you so much. For thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Got a question right here? Yeah, so um, as being the face of the companies uh, that you guys run, um, and kind of putting in a ton of hours into running your companies, how do you deal with burnout? Because it's pretty much inevitable to happen. How do you deal with it uh, if you deal with it, and um, what are some ways? That you can How do you deal with burnout? Yeah, 
it, it's, it's been tough, especially in the early stages, because you're so excited about what you're doing and it becomes your baby. You want to be able to, to nurture it. I've tried to set some deadlines and some timelines for myself. I'm still not the best at it, but I try to wake up early in the morning, either 5 or 5.30, and then I am back at the apartment by you know 6 or 6 or 6.30. And that's usually the time I'm working. And then maybe I'll do a few things while they're watching TV, but I try to be in bed by 10. So that's mostly been my Monday through Friday. I'll do a little bit of work one day on the weekend, but I try to take one day off where I'm just not doing anything related to Trapital. We'll see. I hope I can maintain this in the next phase with all the things that I have coming up down the road. It's a little bit easier now because I have so much that's now just built with like planning and phone conversations, but we'll see. I knew that I needed to do this because I did not have these barriers or the this much discipline the first um, nine months I was doing this when I had my full-time job because I still needed to be committed for that. So I was staying up until one to two in the morning, if not later, and then still getting up to do my day-to-day -day job. And the exhaustion of that, you know, from a burnout perspective was a lot. Like there were times when like, you know, be invited to events or social things and I'm literally dragging and everyone's like, oh, like what's wrong? And it's like, oh, well, I've gotten, you know, four hours of sleep all, all week. But I think now being full-time and being a little bit more intentional, it's helped. And I just hope that I can maintain this, you know, pace or maintain this discipline. You know, human being, I may not be perfect with it, but I'm hoping that that can stay true now that I have more ownership of the time. I would agree on the discipline piece, right? Uh, there's all, but with that said, there's only so much you can do um, within that space um, as an entrepreneur in early stages of your company, because you, you still have to res respond to urgent, um, matters like like especially if you want to move forward and so like things do get kind of like blurry in some areas because like you can i can set the time like i'm an early riser i wake up early um i do emails i do this i have a routine uh, but at the same time sometimes i just really can't get to that routine mind you I'm, i am a disabled um combat veteran i have traumatic brain injury and I have a lot of additional like physical injuries. But with that said, those at times even like um, I, I keep going, but at times they, they come in handy because it's like, okay, like literally I cannot function, you know? And uh, Barbara's, uh, I have an amazing support team. I have <laughs> really short-term memory. Um, and, and you know, I just go, Barbara, that, that thing. <laughs> um, but like I'm surrounded with people who understand like what my issues and like, you know, they don't think of them as disabilities or anything or like hindering my capability to actually run a company and run a team and uh, produce a product. Like we're, we're doing, you know, like our team is going at it. Um, but burnouts do happen. Like that's, that's it, it's a thing. It's almost like you can't prevent it from happening. But what's most important, especially like in the self-care industry is knowing that, okay, like, you know, this is like, this is it. I need to take a break. Um, and that could literally be like taking a hot tub, like going into a hot tub or um, I'm not gonna say have a glass of wine because I don't know how old you are. Um, or you can like literally sit there and like watch a dumb show. That's what I do all the time. Uh, so that my brain isn't functioning. I watch a lot of, you know, housewives sometimes. Um, but like really like it's small things that you implement that you uh, can um, say that those things are self-care. Those things make you happy. And so like try different things to figure out what those simple things and implement them throughout your day to kind of like, you know, not hit the uh, rock bottom burnout situation. So that's personally what I do. Um, let's say I have an idea of like the startup business, like what's the first step like I should do to make it actually happen? Like, you know, they say that the, the start's always the toughest. So like, how do I approach like my idea, like actually making it happen in the real world? So like, yeah, w what, what do I do first? Pretty much. Um, what's the first step after you come up with your idea? So you've heard of ideation phase, right? Like Sorry. the phases of like product development. 
So I would start right there, you know? So like in developing a product, service, or anything, uh, you go through a process of ideation, you know? And there is like a number of tools you can use to really hone in on, okay, like what business are you really in? Like what business model can you implement? All these what, what, who, when, all these things, the market research, the product market fit, all these things, you know, uh, you can find on uh, product development, product management, and follow these step to step. And also, like you know, going looking back to your professor, maybe she's not your professor, but utilizing your resources. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to you know, like everything is on the internet. Um, but again, like myself, I didn't necessarily know exactly where to start. I had an idea. I pursued my masters to kind of like like fine tune the details and come up with the business model and come up with additional things. Um, and so like you could, it, it gives, there's a number of things, a number of free things you can do, um, like, you know, business canvas or, you know, like the values. And so I would start with the ideation phase and like figure what that is for you. And then take it to the next level. Find people who are interested in your product to work with you, et cetera. I, I think just getting out the building and, and talking to folks. Yeah. Um, because you could spend a lot of time, right? Like, hey, I've got the, I got the right idea. Uh, I'm going to go build it, get the team. So you get the team. Then you kind of build this thing. You build the thing. And you've done all those things without actually talking to anybody who would, like, use it. Right. And then it might turn out that you built the wrong thing. Right. And that, that could take, like, sometimes even a year, right? Like, to do all those steps. And you find out you've built the wrong thing. Um, there's a book, uh, The Lean Startup, by Eric Ries, um, which if you haven't read it, you should you should check it out because it it has a lot of these these ideas of well, how do you get started, um, and what are some shortcuts really to learn. Um, it, the assumption of the book is that whatever the first thing you come up with probably isn't the right thing, um, but if you can quickly iterate on that and, and try out a lot of different ideas, then you can get to that right thing. Um, and a lot of times it's not even writing one line of code to get there, but actually just getting out the building. And they encourage folks to, to get out the building. And like find, figuring out what your MVP is, your minimal viable product. Um, so I'm just throwing it. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny you ask, because I think I have to like had the same thought myself like for a while, like, oh, like I've always wanted to start something. What, what was it? And I remember like when I was in, um, business school, I had heard a talk by this guy, Tristan Walker. Do you all know who Tristan Walker is? So Tristan Walker is the founder of Walker & Company, which makes the bevel razor blade. And the company was recently acquired by Procter & Gamble. But he had um, um, made a lot of headlines, and I think he became one of the you know, more well-known, quote-unquote, success stories of someone you know, coming up from the a, a black male coming up through the Silicon Valley path. Um, but one thing that I remember him saying on one of the panels I heard was that, what do you think that you, know, you could be the best person in the world at doing? Because he was coming up with all these ideas of things and he was like, oh, well, this sounds like it's good on paper, but am I the best person to do this? And he kept on challenging himself and that's ultimately how we landed with the idea for Walker and company. So it is trying to essentially take that Procter & Gamble perspective of creating products, but then having a more multicultural focus so the people that look like him in black and brown communities have these type of resources. And he felt like he was the best person to do that. So when I took that similar mentality and thought about myself, I was already doing some of these things. Like I mentioned, I've been doing freelance writing for a number of years, and I had so many friends that would talk to me and be like, oh, like, Runcy, why don't you, that's my last name, Runcy, why don't you go do that full time, see where that goes? Like, why don't you go do that? I'm telling you, this is the path. And I would always kind of push back, be like, no, no, you know, I have this job, I'm in strategic partnerships, I'm gonna continue on this path, I'm gonna become a director, blah, blah, blah. They're like, I'm telling you, do it. And then, I was the one that initially came to that realization. So for me, I did that because I really thought to myself, okay, if I carve out this niche, do I think I could be the best person to cover this? And I answered yes. So I was like, okay, let's see where this goes. Let's see where I can do from there. So that's how I was able to help think through a lot of that. So are you gonna start your idea now? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after college, we'll see. Good. This, do it, do it fast and then pivot like you said. Don't wait. 
All right. Sounds like thanks for coming. Uh, we're all going to.